How did you and Bob Dean actually meet? What were the first words that you guys said, or where did you run into each other uh, for the very first time? I was in the street in front of his house or mine. He said, I understand you're Air Force. I said, yeah. He said, I'm Army. And uh, he said he was retired, and I was retired, so we got to visiting each other. When I retired from the military in 1976, I bought a house in Tucson. I retired from the Presidio of San Francisco, where I had been a command sergeant major there at the 6th Army headquarters. Bought a house in Tucson, moved to Tucson, so help me, the house I moved into was directly across the street from Wendell Stevens. Talk about coincidence. So, you know, our friendship Blossomed more. At that time I was working for the sheriff's department. He was the deputy sheriff and he was bringing a staff car home at night, parking it in his garage. But he, he, he fascinated me because he had been to Japan and he got interested in the Japanese swords. But he had a nice collection of swords on the wall in his house. Got by. We used to just get together and drink beer in either his yard or mine and talk. So whenever we were Together, when we were in the same town, we would share information. As I said, we were both part of APRO for many years, until Coral and Jim died, and we had to put APRO to bed. We both had learned the reality of the extraterrestrial re presence, and I think that's kept us uh, good close friends for years. And I'd kn I've known him and considered him a good and clear dear friend for many years. We have a lot in common, particularly this interest in the uh, the phenomenon, as people would like to refer to it, so-called alien presence. I hate the word UFO. I just don't like to use it because it's so silly. It doesn't really say anything. We're talking about a presence of extraterrestrial intelligence on planet Earth. And Wendell and I share that view. His mail, as you probably have heard him say, was monitored very closely. Mine was too, as a matter of fact. Um, his telephone line was bugged. My telephone was bugged. Just being members of APRO, I think, being on the board, we attracted attention from whoever shall remain nameless, but somebody bugged our phones, monitored our mail, and went. And let me tell you something. They attempted to threaten me a number of times over the years, particularly when I came out out of the closet, so to speak, and uh, began speaking publicly and openly about what I had seen and what I had learned. There were attempts to intimidate me and threaten me. And I threatened right back. Wendell was an officer and a gentleman. I, I had been a commissioned officer from some years before. When I was in Korea, I was a, an infantry officer. But after the RIF 1956 reduction in force, I reverted back to an enlisted grade and uh, worked my way up to command sergeant major, and I was a grunt. I was an infantry officer. I was a, a field soldier. And I carried a gun, and still do. 
I don't have one on me at the moment, but, you know, I carry guns. And when I was threatened, I threatened right back. And uh, I think my first marriage went on the rocks because of my involvement with the UFO field. My first wife, my son's mother, was scared to death of the whole subject. Because I said we, we had our phone bugged and our mail was disturbed. And we were followed in traffic many times. And, uh, oh, they, they had a, a repertoire of little processes where they intimidated you. The phone calls probably were the worst. As I said, my first wife, I think our marriage went on the rocks because of the UFO field. But I was not easily intimidated. Having been an infantry soldier and being a grunt, both in Korea and Vietnam, I, I was not the kind to uh, take kindly to someone trying to threaten me. And uh, I put it out publicly. If you mess with me, bear in mind that I'm packing, I carry a gun, and I'll defend myself. And the government is not going to open the files. We, we have people, prominent people, that have, know all about what the government is sitting on. Dick Cheney, vice president, has, was photographed at level two of S4 looking at one of uh, seven crash disks. I had sat on the information for a long time after I got it because I never knew whether it was a disinformation ploy or not. And then I had decided to accept the speaking engagement in Australia, an invitation, and as soon as I did, they asked me what subjects I told them I was going to introduce a new subject that hadn't been published yet. A day or two later, I got a telephone call, a surprise telephone call, an anonymous voice that says, Stevens, be damn sure you know what you're doing. So my feeling at the time was, I got to risk it sooner or later. It was 10 years after the fact, the man was gone. I thought if, if, they discredit it, attack it and discredit it. Well, if they don't, I win. If they do, I still win because they now have confirmed it. I did get a uh, call when I got back uh, warning me I, that I'm going too far with this. That convinced me that maybe it wasn't a ploy, that maybe there was something to it. And I, so I, I decided to release it here after that, and I did at the conference and nothing happened there. But then I began to think that maybe I had uh, acquired a stature that they began to fear doing something to me. They knew what I knew, that to, to confirm the story by doing something to me would only activate a whole bunch of other investigators that want, would, would want to know what happened to me and why. Kind of the safety that Bob Lazar had. I got a call one time from, uh, I get a lot of calls, and this man said that he'd like to come over and look at pictures. I usually discourage that. And he said that he had some pictures for me. I said, oh, to trade, we can exchange? He said, yes, we can exchange. And I said, well, okay, come on over then. And uh, he said, I'll see you, and he hung up. And uh, about an hour later, I got another call from him. He said that uh, he uh, had checked out of his apartment, gone to the bank to get some money, and when he put his card in the teller, teller machine, it came up uh, count sealed or uh, account frozen or something like that. And he said, he's got, he said, I got money in the bank. He said, so I just went to another machine and used another card. That one was frozen. He went to the bank to draw it out over the counter and they told him that his account was frozen. He couldn't get any money out. So he called me back. He said, I, I fear something serious. He said, I can't get any money any place. All of my accounts are frozen. I have $300,000 in the bank. I said, well, uh, what do you want to do? He said, I want to come over and, and show you and trade some pictures with you. I said, okay, uh, how much uh, is your bus fare? He was at the, calling me from the bus station. I said, he said, it's about $100, but I, don't, I can't get any, any money to cover it. I said, okay, is, is there a convenience store around there? I'll wire you enough money for the bus fare. By Western Union, you can go over there, and give my name as control, and draw the money out, which we did. Money transfer, where I sent money for him to buy the bus ticket to come over and see me. He said he had something for me. 
this is a follow-up when he said he didn't get it I, I went back to Western Union had to make me a copy and he got the money and then he called me and he said uh, I, I'm a little worried he said I I see the same man wherever I'm going reading a newspaper and he said this is suspicious so he said but I'll see you and he told me when the bus would arrive and when he got there and I picked him up at the station uh, he said uh, I didn't bring the pictures he said I I got a little worried about possibly being followed and after he got the ticket he f thought he saw the same person standing behind a newspaper watching him and, and later reading a magazine at the newsstand always within sight of him and he got a little uh, paranoid about that and the fact that he had the pictures in his pocket and he thought he ought to safeguard it something. So I went out behind the bus station got a hard box, a, a car starter box, a good sturdy box put the package in the box and put rocks in it he took it in and had the station wrap it and address it to to ship it on the bus and he said uh, when they got it wrapped and I tried to pay for the shipment they, they collected for the shipment they said it couldn't go on the same bus there wasn't enough time it would come on a following bus so he said I had to get on it and come on he said but it'll be in behind us so to separate himself from the photos does is not a very bright movie does well he thought he could get them on the same bus with him and, and he took the box and had the bus station wrap it and address it to, to, to me at Tucson for delivery and he wanted to get it on the same bus with him, and they said they couldn't put it on the same bus. That it would go on the next bus, be in the following day. And he allowed for that because then he's well, really separated they were from the photo. the bus already, and they, they boarded him, and he got on the bus and came up. Picked him up at the bus station. I brought him out to the house. He was tired from traveling, and I he, he laid on the sofa in the living room there, and I went to sleep. So we had the station check to see if they could find a record of a package that was en route on the next bus. They didn't have any record of it. But they said that's not normal. They don't usually don't in advance anyway. And at what point did uh, Bob Dean get to meet him? Well, I was anxious to tell somebody, and, and Bob was my next door neighbor, and I, I knew that I could depend on him to, to keep the secret. We were afraid that we were being watched by a four men in a white carryall that circled the block. But he was living around the corner from me the whole time that Connor Orion was there. He he was keeping an eye on the house to see who else was hanging around or trying to look over the wall or anything. Had Bob ever let you know about <coughs> the details of S4 at this point he in never time? Discussed it. Never discussed it at no, that point. I was still, <laughs> still keeping my oath of security, you know, which I swore to. Right. But, uh, in 91, I gave that up. I said, yeah. the hell with it, I'm going to tell it. Let, let them do what they're going to do. Yeah. Now, at what point did Bob find out that Connor O'Ryan was over at your house? Uh, Connor was sleeping, and Bob came by in his sheriff's car, stopped in front to say hello, and I said, i got to tell you something. I've got a man in here who says he was a sentry at level two, and he's sleeping on the sofa now, but I don't know how, what to do with him. He said, well listen to his story, see what he's got to say. We don't know anything about that. And uh, so we waited for him to wake up. And Bob had to go out back to duty. He got back in his patrol car and left. He came back again later that evening, stopped again. And it was the next day, wasn't it, when you came back about the third or fourth time, he, Connor was up and I said, he's in the living room, but he's a little, little uh, gun shy. If you want to take a look at him, that's what he looks like. I'll introduce you in a couple of days, wasn't that it? I think so, yeah. And what was your impression? Did you get a chance to meet Connor Ryan, Bob? And what was your impression? I think I met him briefly, didn't I? I yeah. can't remember. Just, just to shake hands. Connor didn't want to talk to anybody. He was scared, and Bob didn't want to get too, too involved in it. I Bob was in uniform, and that was kind of scary to Connor. I think that was about, wasn't that the time you asked me to take a video or something? No, no, that, 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 was, that later. was a little later, but yeah. we can go into that. He and his co-conspirators decided they would have to find somebody that they could trust. And they knew that all clubs, UFO clubs, were infiltrated by agents of one kind or another from the government that were controlling them. And so they went to the public library to look up UFO personalities, and they rejected them one by one until they got down to me, and I found that I was not affiliated with anybody else. I wasn't a member of any group. First of all, what's your background? Can you tell me something about your background? OK, well. I uh, joined the Navy 
in the early 80s. I uh, went into the Naval SEAL program and became a SEAL. I, well, I've been attached to the Special Forces and Special Operations Department of Naval Intelligence for approximately eight, nine years now. I've been on a number of covert operations and just recently, well, about a year ago, I've been I was assigned to a place in Nevada, which most people know as S4, as a sentry, which all sentries there are special forces personnel from all four military branches. I've been there for nine months. I was there for nine months. I've recently been discharged for medically. Don't, I'm still checking that out. While my tour of duty there, I was I was a sentry for in, in the complex, which is an extremely sensitive complex, which they have this there. I have positively identified seven of them, and I've also identified seven humanoid creatures with like grayish skin. I don't know if that's because of the being in the tubes and the solution that they're placed in right now. Right now, I'm on pers basically on the run there. I don't want to mention any names or colleagues. I I don't know what basically my destiny holds for me at this moment. I know that this has to be said and brought out. And I've made contact here with Mr. Stevens because I feel he's the has adequate connections to someday bring all this out in the open. He was a sentry from level two of S4. There were eight of them on duty at a time, eight, eight of them and a, and a sergeant in charge. The sergeant sat at a desk that overlooked the patrol area. They had to walk a, a beat inside of level two. They were supposed to be walking it at attention. They weren't supposed to be looking around. They were supposed to uh, they were there to arrest intruders if they came in. There were visitors that came to, from level one down to level two to go to level three and four. And if their right eye retina scan and palm print, print and card didn't all match at, at, at the elevator, a bell would ring and their job was to arrest with the, and hold them until somebody came down from level one and carried them away. And what was his name? His name was uh, Derek Hennessy. He used the name Connor Orion at my house. I don't know why I was picked for it. I have no idea at all. I've never expressed an interest in those or flying discs. I mean, publicly, you know. So, when you were first informed that you were going to be doing a guard duty on uh, a secret base, were you given any kind of written military transfer orders? Or? No. How did, how did I went to 36, I got off a submarine in Holy Lock, flew to Charleston, to Pensacola, to the Navy, I mean San Diego, went to 32nd Street, Naval facility there, I was briefed that I'd be, I was transferred to a sentry duty in Nevada somewhere, which I, I know that everybody's pretty much aware of all the facilities out in the southwest region out here in the sacred zone. I, I've already had a security clearance for entering some of these facilities. None, nothing of any, nothing like this before. I had no idea that I was going to be involved in anything like this with any 
I mean, when I first walked in, I was I was convinced that they were American prototype vehicles. The Americans were not until I until I viewed the bodies, then I knew, you know something was a little different. So. Connor Ryan starts telling you, Wendell, that he's been to S4, that he's been a sentry at level two. A sentry at level two of S4, and he told me that they live in at that level, they have <laughs> barracks facilities, they sleep in, their meals are catered into them. They're told not to talk to each other at level four, except in front of the television set watching ball games or at the table where they're eating. Otherwise, they're not supposed to be talking at all. Their names were taken away when they got the jobs and they were given numbers. They were addressed, supposed to address each other by number. They, they wore number tags, not name tags. He'd been in the service for over 10 years. He was assigned to Delta Team 6 that was uh, a security, special security team that was called together when they needed them. He said he'd been on patrol, but referred to patrol around the base and another, about other things like that with his team, Delta 6 team and that they did, uh, that was the, their outside activity mostly. The re all the rest of his service was inside in level two of S4. Did he answer to the service commands? He said that they had a direct line, uh, a separate line of command that they responded to. He, he thought it went directly to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Had you heard of anything like that before? Never heard of a direct lines before. He told me that they weren't allowed to socialize inside. They weren't allowed to know each other's true identity. They all arrived alone, and apparently they all arrived at the same time because they all had numbers in serials. 121, 122, 123, 124, and 125. Yeah, he said that they worked uh, regular shift, four hours on and eight hours off, round the clock. He said they weren't allowed to do anything but check people going using the elevators to go down. He said they, they didn't look at their cards or anything. They had a right eye retina scan, a palm print, and a card, a plastic card. And if they didn't match, the bell would ring when they were, their duty was to arrest them and hold them until somebody came down from upstairs to take them away. He never got below level two, never knew what was going on down there. He said that there were separate elevators down to level three and a separate elevator to level four. And they heard strange sounds coming up from the lower level sometimes up the shaft, but they were driven from their uh, S-4 facility to uh, Nellis Air Force Base in a bus with uh, bl blocked out windows that went right into the back of the Imperial Palace to a secure facility maintained by Wackenhut. And they got out of the vehicle in the hotel, and they got in the vehicle to leave again in the hotel. Nobody ever saw them outside. When we returned, from their rest and recuperation leave, they were given a hypnotic re regression uh, to see uh, shortly, to, and he didn't know what happened during that. They never knew what took place. But he told me that they were given an annual physical every quarter. And during the annual physical, they were given a full annual physical, and the last part of the annual physical was a one-hour induction, and they didn't know what took place at that time because they were, a lot, were not allowed to remember any of it. So this was a hypnotic session? It was a hypnotic uh, induction, and he didn't know, he was worried about him probing his subconscious because they, they weren't allowed to remember anything that happened in the induction. Sometimes there were strip search, but not always. Yeah, up to a week before he came to my house, he had just gotten back to Los Angeles, to his, his parents' home, and, and had just rented an apartment in town there. And uh, now he's out and he's afraid he, for his co-conspirators his co inside. And so he decides to come to me to hold the story until, for their safety in case something happened to them. And they had already prepared these stashes of pictures and he was going to give me one of them to hold. And I mean, he wanted me to t tell the story and the rest of the people holding would refer to my uh, stature and reporting these sort of things. There's 15 sentries there that live on the base. We live in level one. There's a barracks there, which gives us TV. The food there is all right. It's equivalent to being on a submarine, basically, the barracks quarters. Of course, you had experience on a submarine. Yes. In preparation for this kind of isolation. Yes, I've been on a 688 class submarine. I did three tours on it. We wore hats like this, but they were just all black. 
this. This is this old set of black uniform fatigues. Uh, the shirts were just the same, just like a regular camo fatigue jacket. Right. Mm -hmm. We carried uh, Glock 9mm, which is a European made 9mm, and uh, sometimes we were distributed M16s and sometimes we were distributed Ingram Mac 10s, 9mm. What would be the occasion for changing the weapons? I think if they feel that there's an outside threat on the base, I don't know if that's just uh, information that they're receiving or a sensor's been breached like the night before. And maybe <coughs> an M16 would be better for a long range weapon, but a MAC-10 would be used just for in case somebody was going to sabotage the plane from inside, from inside personnel. I, or an overran because a MAC-10 is excellent for an urban warfare, an urban weapon. An M16 would be a, a good long range shot. They, uh, there's no identification worn at the facility. No people walking around with identification cards. No what name tags, nothing. No, but the sentries, there is no name tags on our uniforms. No, we don't wear no military medals. We don't, no stripes, no nothing. We wore black uniforms at night, and during the day we wore a brown uniform. No names were ever discussed. We called each other in the barracks just, you know, by our ranks. We used rank only. And, I mean, we were ranked, you know, individually, one, two, three, four, five, and six. I mean, detachment of six guys. At any given time, it was an actual detachment of ten people, but in my detachment, we had all got there at the same time. We are all briefed at the same time, so I guess that they had relieved the whole complete detachment. But the other detachments, I know, were there for a little bit longer. As I say, I mean, we were on four-hour shifts with an eight-hour off, four hours, eight off, four on, eight off. When we're off our shifts, we don't know what happens on other shifts, you know. We're, we're not briefed in any way whatsoever on anything that happened the night before or anything. We're told not to talk with any security personnel during any of our duties at all. We're not allowed to say one word. We're supposed to use peripheral vision at all times. Uh, we're not allowed to discuss any duties while we're in our cubicles at night, our barracks, as you could say. I mean, that's just the way it was. There were audio pickups all through the place, and if they were, if they talked to anybody else, they were called in and, and, and uh, treated. I mean, our sole thing to do is just to, is to be a sentry, an idiot, a grunt, you know, I mean, you're just standing there. And we don't hear knowing where everything's need to know and we don't need to know nothing, so that's the way it was. None of the chain of command was ever discussed. Our boss was the man, the watch commander out front, which was in charge of all security. I have no idea, no I have no idea who was in charge of the facility or who even ran the facility. And I've been in the Navy so I mean with the special warfare department so long that you know better than to ask questions by now, the questions are just don't ask. As I said before, I've already been with the Special Forces for so long. I, I think that they really trusted me. I think they trusted everybody because we're basic guns and everybody's expendable to us. And we can be written off very easily by Kate. Yeah. These Special Forces, you knew that, Tony, your parents, he was in Nicaragua, he got shot, that's all you need, or, you know what I mean? He died in an accident. Parents are going to accept that because they've already accepted the fact that you're a special forces personnel and high risk, high risk job. He was a he was a strong, healthy young man, uh, robust. He uh, was a uh, he he joined the Marines and then stayed in the Marines and he kept training up to a, a SEAL status and then a Black SEAL status. And uh, which is the highest ranking, or the highest train level a Marine can reach. But uh, when I found the the W-4 in his wallet while he was taking a shower, he was drawing $72,000 a year on a commission from the CIA, which is about equivalent to a colonel grade. He had uh, sparse blonde hair, 
that wasn't real, not real shaggy hair. He was, uh, he, he stood very erect. He looked, looked like a Marine, like a, like a soldier. He had the uh, blue eyes. He'd answer questions, but he, he didn't uh, add a lot. If he didn't ask the question, you're not, not going to get any information. He had a tattoo on his right arm that he kept covered up, and he got a, a mark for each mi special mission carried out. Now, to him, his special missions were were uh, terminating uh, enemies of the United States government. If they were characterized as enemies and they didn't want them to go to trial because the information might come out that would be of a sensitive nature, they would just terminate them instead. And uh, he understood that that was what he was doing, and that was his job. To me, it's murder. To him, it was a mission. He was also living the life of a government assassin. All the special troops there apparently were being used for the same purpose. And they thought they were, those assassinations were called missions, special missions. They got a special bonus for each special mission and a hash mark on the arm. And uh, these young men were selected when they were in their high teens, very impressionable age. And they looked for people that already were patriotic. And they, they, they worked on the patriotism in, in boot camp until they became so patriotic that they would weep when the flag would go up and down the flagpole. And they were training to, to kill, to take out America's enemies. And so for them to carry out one of these missions, all the, their leaders had to do was characterize somebody as a, a traitor or an enemy of the United States or a spy and their job as, as top Marines was to take out the enemies of the country and they would do it with no compunction. Well, even if it was a brother, they would do it, or a sister, a close relative. Because they, if they were trained to implicitly believe their leaders. Their leaders could not err. And so these missions were, were simply missions to kill spies, internal spies, in, within the system. And they thought that's what they were doing, is ridding the system of its betrayers, of its traitors. <clears throat> so it didn't bother him at all about murdering people. These guys were exempt because they were carrying out a special mission. Uh, and they really believed this. They didn't feel any, they didn't feel bad about their hits. Because they, they believed, sincerely believed that they all were traitors and enemies of the country. He'd gone to take a shower in my shower and he took, uh, laid his keys and wallet on the coffee table in front of the the sofa where I was sitting when he went in to take a shower, and I thought, oh, I'll look in his wallet and see if he is who he says he is. And when I did, I saw there's no Connor Orion in the wallet. All, all the names in there were Derek Hennessy. So I looked a little further. I took out a, a, a group of a credit cards in an envelope, I mean a, in a pocket in the wallet, and folded in between the cards, folded four ways so he couldn't see it. And when I separated the cards, there was this piece of paper folded tightly. It turned out to be a W-4, which is the employer's statement of withholding salary base and withholding, and it showed that he was earning $72,000 a year. Well, I didn't want him to know that I was snooping in his wallet, so I folded it all up carefully, put it all back exactly the way it was, and put it back on the table. He did not know that I had dis discovered this. I had to kind of bait him to get some answers, so I asked him what he was doing. And and he said something about a special mission. I said, what's a special mission? He said, eh, taking care of government business. He said, we're trained, uh, recruited and trained to take care of enemies of the American government. He said, if they're spies, they're spies. They're enemies of the government. That's our duty. He was also drawing the sergeant's pay. And he told me that he was drawing special pay outside of the country, which was deposited in accounts outside of the country. He, had, he said he had $300,000 saved up. He said, I got $5,000 bonus for each special mission. I said, what's a special mission? He says, that's a, carrying out a mission for the government to uh, terminate a person that they can't afford to bring to trial because he might, it might reveal too much. So they terminate him another way so that the secrets don't get out. In the, the, the same cards, folded the same way with the W-4 statement, was a copy of a hit order and a mug sheet. The mug sheet showed a front and face photographs of the hit, the 18th hit, handprint and fingerprints for all the 10 fingers, and a name and an address. And 
I folded that the same way and put it back all back in his wall so he didn't know that I had seen it. He, but later I got him to tell me about his special missions and he told me about the 18th one being his last one. And I fished a little bit and got more information, but I never did tell him that I would looked in his wallet. I don't think he ever knew that. Did, when you took it out of his wallet, did you go over and scan it on your copy? Is that how you got copies? I and made a copy, yeah. Okay. This is the hit order that he received under his, uh, in, in, in the valise with his clothes was the hit order and his instructions to report to, says, Ghost Walker, you are to report to the American Embassy in Budapest, Hungary. You will be received by S.A. Gray Wolf. As a unit, you will proceed to terminate a X S A David T. Johnson. That's the hit order. And there's David T. Johnson. He was a Army Green Beret. Staff officer in the American Embassy in Budapest. Murdered. Murdered. By Connor O'Ryan. By Connor O'Ryan and his partner, they both put bullets in him. His partner was uh, S. A. Gray Wolf. Zoom in, and you can see it's the CIA. Connor O'Ryan was Coast Walker. <clears throat> when they were on missions like that, they were not allowed to exchange names. He never knew who Gray Wolf was. He was in level two of S four when he found a note under his pillow after he'd gone off shift. Report to his sergeant. The sergeant handed him an envelope and told him the car was waiting and they'd drive him to Las Vegas to the bus station. When he got to the, to the bus station in Las Vegas, he, uh, he knew, having done this before, that he would look for a key taped to the back of, of the locker. So he felt around the back of the locker, so he found a key taped there. He had the locker number, he opened the locker and took out a, a valise, a traveling valise. Nice one, with a suit of clothes, shoes, socks, a shirt, tie, and everything for business travel. And he put those clothes on and put his clothes back in the locker, his marine clothes back in the locker, and took the bus down to Los Angeles and uh, the, air, the airline ticket to Budapest. And had a schedule and everything else on, so he... he, he Somebody had already coordinated, he didn't have a long wait any place. The last one, the 18th one, when he was sent to Budapest, Hungary, he was paired with another CIA agent, or another agent like himself, who was another Special Forces troop. And they were given Hungarian clothes and Hungarian weapons and ammunition, shoes and everything to do it. A mug shots of their hit and where he lived, maps of where he lived, his route that he traveled, uh, where he went to church, where he went to the grocery store and everything. And they, they took him out together, one on each side of his car when he came out of the grocery store with his groceries, putting him in his car. They hit him from both sides with his two teenage kids in the car. And they put it seven or eight with bullets in him and he died. See, and they just pocketed their weapons and walked away in the crowd. They looked like everybody else there. And, they went back to the American Embassy and reported to the attaché who gave them the clothes and the guns and the money. The attaché gave them their clothes, but traveling clothes back and drove them to the airport and they went home. Now that, that's, that's what a mission was. And they were given back their, their American clothes and money to the airport right away in an embassy car to put them on an airplane to get out of there. And he said right back into S4 and I said what a marvelous way to cool somebody who just carried out a hit. He said, yeah, he says, nobody can get to us, nobody can investigate anything. In my mind, it was the most secure facility we had. Nobody can get in or out. I said, well, all of, are, do all of you carry out these special missions? He said, we all do special missions, yes. That really is frightening to me because we don't know how long this has been going on. He told me he didn't have a chevron mark for this. I, I never did get a count on a mark, but he had a lot of chevron marks, vertical marks in a certain part of the shield. And the, the Army Green Beret Sergeant who was the target of their assassination in That's Budapest. What it turned out to be and that worried him some. He was, why? Because he was a senior special service officer himself and the Green Beret was the same as him. He was also a special officer, special services officer uh, in the Army. 
they were about equivalent status, and he thought maybe this guy was like him and just happened to know too much after he'd already carried out the order. He didn't question it until they killed him, and then he began to have his, some remorse about it. They killed him in front of his teenage kids sitting in the car. And he began to wonder what he had done to become such an enemy of the American government. Then he began to think about his own career and thinking that maybe that guy was just like him. So I said, uh, don't you think uh, you might become vulnerable here someplace along the way that you know too much? He said, I think that's what's happened now. What's the uh, p purpose of this? Why is this in the file? Uh, there was a helicopter crash uh, in the S-4 area that he told me that the crash was that the government sacrificed an airplane to dispose of six people. And these, these are people that the government killed off in Area 51 because of, for reasons of their own. And they sacrificed a helicopter, sabotaged a helicopter, and they killed them all on it. Three of these workers were, were targets, the rest of them were accidental uh, victims. Wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. Do they sometimes accident whole groups of people together like that? I don't know. He told me one time he was on a hit with, was partnered with a Vatican hitman on a hit. I didn't know the Vatican had hitmen. Did you? I had heard that they did, that they had their own secret service, but I didn't know that they, they put out hits, but they control so much wealth and they're so powerful within the scope of the, the planet that uh, it makes sense. I mean, the leader of the Catholic Church right now is an ex-Nazi, right? Yeah. Pope uh, Benedict the... What's his name? Pope? Ratzinger is his... Yeah. Benedict the Sixth, yeah. Benedict the Sixteenth, or whatever. He's a he's ex, ex Nazi. Yeah, he was Nazi. a Nazi youth. Yeah. Yeah. This appalled me to understand and find out that we are executing our own American citizens with other American citizens and American money for nefarious reasons without the justice system that protects us all. And it's run by the government and ordered by higher authorities. The government knows what they're doing. When I asked him about his salary, he said he got $5,000 bonus for each special mission. And he had just finished his 18th. And by now I, I, I knew from seeing his papers that his special missions were murder, government executions. The pay we were, the pay we got was we got, I have always gotten demolition pay and junk pay being with the teens, but when we go on a covert all, we get hazardous duties pay. Now, being with this detachment, we got hazardous duties pay too. Which is actually So we are still paid to not all the uh, no, no, U.S. Navy. Exact. E6. Petty officer first class pay rate with. I got jump pay if I made so many jumps. Demolition pay, <clears throat> because we're demolition experts, being with the team, the EBT, and uh, hazardous duties pay when we were on hazardous operations, any kind of covert op or in a country that the American government considers hostile, we can get a hazardous First of all, it's the Atomic Energy Commission area. The Navy had a Navy Auxiliary Airfield there that was had arrestor gear on, on the runways that they practiced, practiced carrier landings on. And that's all it was. I used to stop there and get gas when I was ferrying aircraft across, across the country because the gas trucks were always sitting there and they were not, very, not used very much. And, I could get gas immediately. There was a little snack bar right at the operations center I filed, where I filed my flight clearance. And I'd take off and leave in a short time. Was that Groom Lake? That was Groom Lake Auxiliary Naval Airfield. And one, the last time I stopped there, I was coming from Troutdale, Oregon, going to Oklahoma City with a, a small trainer, that a, a fixed base operator, about 10 of them from the surplus from up there. 
And I, and I was ferrying it through, and when I landed, they won my special a copy of my special orders. I told them, what special orders? They said, you can't land here without special orders. And I said, well, I've always landed here for gas. And they said, well, you, you have to have special orders now. And they did give me gas, but made me leave right away and made me understand that, that I can't come back. What year was that, roughly? Uh, that was uh, in the early 50s. Later, in, uh, I began to hear about a Project Red Light going on at Groom Lake. And when I tried to get information on Project Red Light, uh, that was so secret that nothing was available. But I had, I was doing a lecture at, Oklahoma, at Oakland, California, when I mentioned Project Red Light. And the fact that the, they closed the base, nobody knows what they were doing there. And a guy came up out of the audience afterwards to talk to me. He said, I was a, a technical sergeant in the medical corps in the hospital detachment. He told me that when, auxiliary, when, when Groom Lake Auxiliary Airfield was closed, they brought in the reinforced CB battalion. They closed everything but the base engineers and the hospital. And the hospital served the reinforced uh, CB battalion for until they were almost through working. And then they brought in a a hospital team to take over the hospital. But during the two years that they were servicing, they heard scuttlebutt about what they were doing. They took up the runway, they took down buildings and put up camouflage netting to make it look like nothing had changed. And when they got through, they put the buildings and the runway back. And uh, he, he, that sergeant thought that they had only put extra facilities under the runway and some under the ramp, the parking ramp. But he never knew how big it was or anything, and uh, that's all I had for some time until I found uh, at another lecture like that a man came up to me said that he was working in the CB battalion. He was a tech sergeant, engineer, project engineer, and he told me about dig dig digging the four levels, uh, and, and then they started putting the putting the runway all back together again above. But they, he said that they. Within those four levels, they, they, they prepared a, a habitat that had a controllable atmosphere. You know, but he said that the CB battalion only dug the hole in the ground and laid some foundations. Then they brought in other contractors to put the facilities in on top of the foundations and finish it and put the runway back. So nobody ever had the whole project. It was always parceled out like that. And that was the Groom Lake project, that the Area 51 now. That was Area 51. The most infamous and notorious secret military site in the world, Area 51 at Groom Lake, Nevada. A restricted government site that guzzles down black budget funds, hidden in plain sight, exotic, dangerous, highly classified, parts of the complex require Q30 clearance or higher. Above top secret, and deadly, and may be controlled not just by human beings. Testimonies suggest that beings not of this earth may even share control of the base. Area 51 was originally constructed in 1955, one year after the Edwards and Holloman treaties in 1954 were arranged, clandestinely in utmost secrecy, between officials in the U.S. government and off-world beings who possessed highly advanced technologies that lured in the lusty, weapons-minded military brass. Originally known as Watertown Strip in 1955, brass. Originally known as Watertown Strip in 1955, after CIA Director Alan Dulles' hometown, the growing base was later dubbed Paradise Ranch, now simply the ranch. The 575 square mile rectangle of land was officially designated Area 51 outside the control of our 50 states by the Atomic Energy Commission in June 1958. The Area 51 control tower identifies itself as Dreamland in radio communications and warns off all aircraft from flying over the box, its forbidden airspace known officially as R-4808N. Some insiders have even dubbed Area 51 the dark side of the moon. The town of Rachel, Nevada, with its population of just around 200 people, is known for the Little Alien Restaurant, complete with its own UFO video and book library for patrons and visitors from all corners of the world. Just to the west of Rachel 
is a backgate guard entrance to the Nellis Bombing and Gunnery Range, 8 million acres large, inside whose boundaries is Area 51. The townsfolk of Rachel can see the 9,000-foot Bald Mountain Peak just to the south, which is capped with an observation and communications facility directly connected with Area 51. Highway 375 runs through Rachel and along the northeastern perimeter of restricted land, which was officially dedicated in the mid-1990s as the Extraterrestrial Highway, a twisting 98-mile stretch of single-laid road absent of gasoline stations anywhere. Amid the Joshua trees and cactus and tumbleweeds of Tikaboo Valley lives a generations-old cattle ranching family. The ranchers are known for their famous black mailbox, which marks the commencement of a dirt road between mileposts 29 and 30 that leads toward their ranch, and also towards Groom Lake just beyond to the southwest. A little farther southeast on Highway 375, between mileposts 34 and 35, Groom Lake Road begins its trail across the desert floor of Tikaboo Valley toward jumbled hills. Almost every morning, buses with blacked out windows carrying Area 51 workers speed along to the top secret facilities by way of the Groom Lake Road. The perimeter of Area 51 shares a border with the Yucca Flat region of the Nevada test site where over 900 atomic tests have been conducted since 1951. Beginning in July 1962, all its atomic detonations were exploded underground, but for what purpose remains unclear. The Area 51 land is managed by the 99th Air Base Wing at Nellis Air Force Base. However, Area 51 is also an adjunct to Edwards Air Force Base Flight Test Center, which appears to have control of operations at Groom Lake. And just 40 miles southwest of Groom Lake is the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Storage Facility. Groom Lake is a dry salt lake located in Emigrant Valley north of the Papoose Mountain Range and Area 51 is on Groom Lake's southern shore. In 1995, federal land grabs have expanded the scope of the base and eliminated certain mountaintop viewing spots for civilians, including Whitesides Mountain and Freedom Ridge, despite substantial public outcry. Intruders are subject to the use of deadly force which was supposedly authorized under the terms of the 1950 McCarran Internal Security Act. Enforcing security are hired personnel from Wackenhut and Sandia security companies, along with a contingent of Navy SEALs and Delta Force. Black Hawk and Sikorsky helicopters, Jeeps and Humvees patrol constantly, seeking out intruders using every technology at their disposal. The ranch, as insiders know it, is the most protected known base on the planet's surface and its personnel are required to take a lifetime oath of secrecy. Area 51 is likely run by the United States Navy, even while it appears the Air Force maintains operations out of Edwards Air Force Base in California. The radar facilities always have at least one radar pointed straight up to monitor the skies above, as it is well known that modern satellites from foreign nations can see through topsoil with synthetic aperture radar and infrared imaging to detect tunnels below the surface. Strangely, due to the Open Skies Treaty of March 24, 1992, member countries signing the treaty are allowed to use satellites to take photos of the Area 51 base in exchange for the U.S. being allowed to spy on other treaty signing nations' top secret facilities. Participating countries include the Soviet republics, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, Turkey, Ukraine, Norway, Denmark, Poland, and Romania. Ironically, the American taxpayers that foot the bills for Area 51 are not allowed any information regarding Area 51, even those Americans who have suffered chemical contamination working at Area 51, for court cases seeking due compensation for their injuries. Incoming flights come from several key installations, all directed by the control tower, situated about one quarter mile northeast of an enormous 100 foot tall hangar, suspected of housing a giant elevator that can lower heavy tonnage aircraft down to a vast underground complex below. Along with Area 51, Bechtel controls Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and a host of the most sensitive nuclear weapons facilities for the U.S. Department of Energy. 
Defining the word cronyism, the Bechtels have lorded over White House political decision-making for decades, especially administrations headed by Nixon, Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, and Bush Jr. It was Bechtel that was awarded the no-bid contract for Hurricane Katrina relief. Bechtel is where our tax dollars go to die. George Schultz and Caspar Weinberger are Bechtel alums, and so are former NATO Supreme Allied Commanders. Among Bechtel's many major construction projects are countless oil platforms, refineries, and pipelines, including the Alaska Pipeline and countless tracks of railroad, including the entire BART urban transit system in San Francisco. Bechtel and its partners built the Hoover Dam project and the ARCO Experimental Breeder Reactor, which produced the first ever electric power from a nuclear source, leading to Bechtel gathering the largest contracts for the biggest nuclear power plants worldwide. Unfortunately, numerous hazardous waste violations, ballooning profits in Boston's Big Dig, outrageous behavior in the reconstruction of Iraq, inciting Bolivians to riot against Bechtel, which was trying to privatize the water supply, and membership in the Trilaterals, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bohemian Grove has not endeared Bechtel to the vast population of taxpaying Americans. In terms of financial transparency, Bechtel is not. As a private, multinational corporation with a jaw-dropping list of subsidiaries, Bechtel is much more opaque than all publicly held multinationals, having no need to go public for money. Only big oil money like Avery Rockefeller's money is capable of behaving like this. Now Bechtel wants control of the world's fresh water supplies. Bolivia told Bechtel, no way in hell. The control tower ushers in the Janet facility flights operated by EG&G from Las Vegas' McCarran International Airport, but personnel are also purportedly brought in from Lockheed Skunk Works facilities in Palmdale, from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in San Francisco, and from Los Alamos National Laboratories in New Mexico. Area 51's main runway is 30,000 feet long, nearly six miles, which when compared to runways where the space shuttle lands, which are barely half that size at three miles, makes Area 51's runway seem extreme. Area 51's southern hangars have held the A-12 ox cart and the SR-71 Blackbird and likely craft much more exotic. The northern hangars, or red hat hangars, house what is dubbed captured foreign technology, which is disassembled and blueprinted. Other buildings and facilities allow for on-site avionics modification, but below the buildings is a deep underground tunnel complex with tunnels 30 feet high and 70 feet wide, and what goes on there only a few brave souls have ever shared publicly. Most personnel choose to enjoy the privileges of a top-secret base. Key personnel are spoiled with lavish meals at Sam's Place, a recreational facility for members of Club Fed. Worker housing buildings are on site for lower level personnel that live on the base. The most insidious of the dangers for the lower level Area 51 workers was the chemical contamination from waste burned in open pits and trenches at Groom Lake. In 1994, law professor Jonathan Turley of George Washington University represented Area 51 widows of government contractors Walter Kaza and Robert Frost and sued the Air Force and Environmental Protection Agency. Professor Turley demonstrated in court that high levels of dioxin, the benzofurin, and trichloroethylene led to skin, liver, and respiratory failures and death in numerous Area 51 personnel. However, the United States Air Force responded by classifying all evidence of contamination in order to skirt the lawsuit, according to Congressman Lee Hamilton. Furthermore, the federal government invoked the state secrets privilege, citing the lawsuit as a threat to expose national security secrets. U.S. Judge Philip Pro rejected the government's argument, so a Majestic 12 lapdog, President Clinton, issued a presidential determination exempting the Air Force's operating location near Groom Lake, Nevada. Clinton's action forced Judge Pro to dismiss the case for lack of evidence. Turley appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on the grounds that the federal government was abusing its power, but the Ninth Circuit refused Turley's appeal, and the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. 
60 Minutes ran their investigative inquiry on March 17, 1996, in which Congressman Lee Hamilton stated, I'm not personally prepared to take the word of a person who has, or an entity which has, a huge financial stake in the outcome here, that this information needs to be classified. Professor Jonathan Turley added, The question is whether they are going to be held accountable, because ultimately that is what this case is about whether there is something unique about the United States government that either makes it accountable or exempt from its own laws. While Area 51 has produced aviation advances for the U-2, SR-71, F-117, B-2 stealth bomber, it has also secretly produced the still unacknowledged TR-3Bs and Aurora spacecraft. And besides devouring hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe even trillions, for its projects, the federal government is also turning a blind eye on billions of dollars of fraud and tax evasion by selected government contractors who are not claiming the true taxable value of their facilities to the Lincoln County tax assessor, who is not even allowed into Area 51 to perform his county's tax assessments. Area 51 has claimed only $2.5 million of property value to Lincoln County, even while accepting annual budgets in the billions of dollars from us, the American taxpayers. Dangerous underground atomic detonations, nuclear storage and waste concerns, the use of deadly force against civilians, lavish treatment of high officials, uncompensated chemical contamination of its workers, abuse of the law and its own power, tax evasion, and evidently secret extraterrestrial alliances. These improper government practices should impel Congress to hold open investigations into the nearly 60-year history of corporate and federal abuses at Area 51. The area relative... 51 is a big area. It has, it has the Groom Lake Naval Auxiliary Airfield uh, in, in the valley with the long runway in, in the dry lake bed, but through the mountain on the, in the next Salt Valley south, and you got, uh, there's a mountain range in between, and between there's a tunnel now that runs all the way from Groom Lake through to S4. It's about eight miles uh, through mountains. That tunnel is over. Has, the, the tunnel is over 100 feet wide, and nearly 100 feet from top to bottom, and that's where super secret aircraft are stored. It becomes a huge hangar. And the, the vehicles can be taken out either the S4 end or the Groom Lake end. S4 is where the the hangars were built at the end of the uh, of that uh, tunnel on opening into the valley is where S4 facilities were built, and they were they were built into the mountain, but they and they had they were camouflaged. They had a, a side of the mountain slid aside and. To make the doors and rolled away and, and, and opened the, the facility and that's how they took the the uh, captured vehicles in and out was they'd roll the, the door back and take them out and when the Russian satellites were had already passed or not due they bring them back in before the satellites were due again did you ever hear talk about uh, s4 let me explain something about area 51 it it was at the time simply a range as part of Camp Mercury. When you look at the map, you had areas such and such, 49, Area 50, Area 51. These were all part of the original Camp Mercury atomic test site facility. So 51 was part of Camp Mercury initially. And while I was there, I was a Department of Energy school in 1979. And uh, the weekend in between, and some of the contractors who dined with us in the mess hall, we'd gotten to know pretty well. Some of, they were instructors as well. They said, look, uh, let's all hop on the bus after uh, breakfast on Saturday. They invited us to hop on the bus and we're gonna show you guys something. So away we went on this fairly rickety old bus, you know, wasn't one of the more modern, more comfortable ones. And down the road we went, we went over a pass into Groom Lake from the other side, from the rear. I never went through any of the mailbox out on the road kind of garbage. We came in from the back over to, uh, to Groom Lake. 
and they took us over to one of the facilities and we got out of the bus and anyhow um, never made it to S4 but I heard the contractors talking about it and some of them were contractors who were involved in the construction they said that that S4 had 30 levels you take a 30 story building put it in the ground and that's where apparently the aliens were and uh, some of the contractors had seen them what were their they, descriptions they had not got very close to them. well they, they appeared to be kind of like grays uh, but not the little ones these were five 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 and a half feet tall or six feet even they were grays, and they had a fairly large eye, but they, they were not the little guys with the wraparound eyes. I was to learn later that those little dudes are uh, laboratory products. Organic robots. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're organic robots, I guess is the best description. At the very bottom of this thing at S4, there was a, a gate. A retired bird colonel shared with me, he said, I went down to level, the lower level, the third level, third, third floor. He says, they told me to put on a summer uniform, and it was winter time. <clears throat> he went down, they uh, had his luggage and suitcase and his briefcase and all, and he stepped through the doorway and he came out and he was at, uh, What's the middle of Australia? Pine Gap. Pine Gap. Mm -hmm. He went through a door at S4, and on the it other side was Pine, Pine Gap. Gap. Australia. Yeah. So which they already we, had teleportation at that point. Which we, we were to learn later it was just a mile and a half from one of the major UFO ET installations on the planet. The, uh, <clears throat> the ETs had had a facility there for from apparently over a hundred years. The retired colonel told me, he said, you know, I, I was in a state of shock. He said, I didn't feel a thing. He says, it went through the door. I'm, I'm in S4 in Nevada. He says, the next thing I'm coming up, getting, being led off to a private set of quarters in a facility that is in Pine Gap, Australia. And he says, I, I just, it took me a while to adjust to it. When we were sitting down together with Bob Dean, uh, Bob Dean says uh, he heard that S4 had 30 levels, which are three sections of 10 levels each, coded green, blue, and red. But I gather from your 10 days with Connor Ryan that he only knew about four levels. He only knew about four levels. And uh, He never saw anything at three or four. Do you subscribe to Bob Dean's description from somebody? I don't have any information on the other levels. <clears throat> Do you think they exist, or do you think there are only four? I don't know. If they if they exist, they would have been dug after the initial red light project that set up the, the facility there, the four, first four levels. I think one of the things that impressed me the most about what the contractors would share with us is that they were in the tunnel building business, and they were digging tunnels all over the damn place. And uh, they had these big 40-foot tunnel boring machines, you know, on railroad tracks. They'd go into the side of a mountain and they would go down and then out. And uh, they were laughing one time. They said they were digging a tunnel and they ran into another tunnel, which they didn't know about. Really? And they said the tunnel they ran into was better than the one they were building. And uh, we were, you know, all our ears perked up. And I said, what? He says, this thing was beautiful. He says, uh, it was big and it was smooth and uh, the walls were like glass. And he says, we built this damn thing. The ones we were building were, you know, rough and not too ready. And we had to plaster them and, you know, finish them up a bit, cement and all to make them livable. But he says, we ran into a series of tunnels that uh, were incredible. And uh, what we were going to do is we were going to get a Jeep and load it up with, uh, you know, spotlights and uh, water and whatever. And we were going to explore. And one of our senior supervisors, he said, found out about our plan and threatened to court martial or put us all in jail. And he said, you stay the hell out of those tunnels. Those are not ours. Those are 
not for you to look at. You leave them alone. And he said, all among themselves, who the hell built those tunnels, you know? Well, who had the technology to build those that good? And here we are digging these things in. When I retired, we, we knew officially at my level of security that there were four different groups that we were interrelating with. They were all humanoid, but only one was human, or at least so much like us that you couldn't tell the difference. Technologically, they are so far beyond us that, just, that we can't even imagine it. And uh, I think spiritually they are so far beyond us. And I think those are the ones that are really calling the shots. I think those are the ones that are really in, in charge of the program. And you see other aliens, you see little grays, you see tall grays, you see tall whites with no, no hair at all. You even see, some of the people have described seeing reptilians. I don't deny that. I don't doubt that for a moment. But I've concluded that the one group that seems to be running the program, at least on planet Earth, are the Anunnaki from Nibiru, our, our cousins, our forefathers, as it were. So it's possible that they had built those tunnels? I think so. They said that there were tunnels all over the damn place. There were tunnels going from uh, Groom Lake to Nellis, which is what, about 10 miles, yeah. you know, 20 miles, something like that. There were rumors that some of the tunnels went over to Fort Huachuca, which is in southern Arizona. And you had been stationed there at one time? And I had been stationed at Huachuca. And I knew there were some, you know, mysterious goings on there, but <clears throat> anyhow, they said that uh, there were tunnels all over the place. So when I hear these rumors about tunnels yeah. across the continent with uh, high-speed rail yeah, I'm not surprised. So the Phil Schneider <laughs> reports about underground tunnels and some of the maps that he provided, that kind of thing, uh, do you guys have problems with no, that? That makes sense to me. I know the chemical structure and the application of construction value explosives. I earned a reputation on it. I helped hollow out over 13 deep underground military bases in the United States I worked on the Malta project. I worked on West Germany on its uh, military bases, and Spain on its, and Italy on its. Anyway, of these 129 bases, they've been building them day and night unceasingly for since the early 40s. Some of them were built even earlier than that. The average depth of each base is roughly a mile deep. They are basic whole cities hollowed out underground. They are somewhere between two and two thirds cubic miles and four, cub four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. My yeah. base is comprised basically of large cities underground. They're connected by high speed monorail magneto leviton trains that can go up to Mach 2. Uh, books have been written, uh, several books recently have been written about this activity, all of which is verifiable through bibliography. Richard Souter's book, he's a PhD architect, and he's written, he alone also is uh, risking his life by talking about this. He worked uh, with a number of government agencies on deep underground military bases. I have helped build two main concerned bases within these United States that have some significance as far as what is it called the New World Order. Number one is Dulce, New Mexico. I was involved in 1979 in a horrendous firefight with alien human, alien human type, whatever you want to call them. And uh, I was one of the survivors. I'm probably the only talking survivor you'll ever hear. Two other survivors are under close guard somewhere in these United States. One is not in very good shape. He's been living in uh, Canada. So I'm about the only one around that knows the firefight, that knows all the detailed files of the entire operation. 66 Secret Service agents, FBI and the like, Black Berets died in that firefight. I was there. Uh, my father. Otto Oscar Schneider, there's an interesting story about him. 
Um, he fought on both sides of the war. He was originally a U-boat captain. He was captured. Came off, he was captured by the French. He was turned over to the United States Army. He was turned over to the United States Navy. He was repatriated here to Cocoa Beach, Florida, and Fort Lauderdale, and uh, taken up to uh, a Philadelphia Navy Yard thereafter. And he was a master machinist as well as uh, an MD doctor. He later became an MD doctor. He never did anything with like it. But basically, he was involved with uh, uh, different kinds of concerns, um, such as uh, A-bomb and H-bomb and, and uh, Philadelphia Experiment uh, and these other kinds of projects. Uh, his groundwork, he, he invented a camera, a high-speed camera, that took pictures of the first atomic tests in Bikini Island and uh, 12th of July, 1946, to which I have original photographs of, which show unidentified flying objects fleeing the bomb site at a high rate of speed. Bikini Island at the time was infested with little things and, and various depths of, of its waters. The natives always saw them. The natives had problems with their cattle, or basically pigs is what they raised, and other things, although this story has never come out. Uh, this is basically what happened. Maybe somebody knows a senator or a congressman or has had help by such. There's one outstanding in Oregon. His name is Mark Hatfield. That man helped me fight the federal government. See, my father left me these pictures of what he took at Bikini Island. Operation Crossroads. And I'm going to have this one out on the table. It's the original. I'll ask you, please, carefully handle it and try not to put too many fingerprints on it. Right over here, right over here, and I'll point to it, and I'll point to it. <laughs> hey, Echo, it is a structure that is an unidentified flying object. This was taken the 12th of July, 1946. The federal government at that time knew all about flying saucers what they were and what their agenda was, and how they want to control us by world domination. Without question, they know about it. UFOs really wasn't my bag until uh, I started work at Area 51, uh, which is in the Nellis Air Force Base uh, north of uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. The Guardians of Stealth. There are over three cl distinct classifications of special police used to guard one of our most well-kept secrets. Number one, this is the most disturbing of all. The MJTF, and that, by the way, that stands for Military Joint Tactical Force, otherwise known as the Black Berets. Some people call them the Delta Force, and there are other names for it. Excuse me, a multinational tactical force primarily used to guard the various stealth aircraft worldwide. Stealth aircraft, for instance. The F-117A, there's 157 of the son of a guns going around. You know their sole purpose is? They're all loaded with LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R, and SEER, Computer Enhanced Imaging Radar. They can fly over your house. They can see you walking from room to room. They can tell if you've got an old antique rifle on your mantelpiece. They can see objects in the house with a variation limit and capability of one inch to 30,000 miles. That's how accurate this is. Is this a proper use of our tax money? I would say not. The Black Budget is a secretive group, basically a secret budget. It garners one quarter of the gross national product, the entire gross national product of these United States. At present, the gross national product is around $5 trillion. So one quarter of that's about one, one and a quarter trillion dollars per year. Uh, at least 1.023 trillion, and I say at least, is used in black budget programs like deep underground military bases. <coughs> Presently, there are 129 deep underground military bases in these United States. Still, 68% of the U.S. military budget is directly or indirectly affected by the black budget. 
Star Wars, uh, the wise nickname Star Wars, Strategic Defense Initiative relies heavily upon stealth weaponry. By the way, none of this would have been available without us taking apart with a fine tooth comb crashed flying saucers that either we downed or they crashed themselves into our deserts. None. Budget from U.S. Congress five-year plan that we're told about is 247.6 million. You couldn't buy the spare parts of, of all the black helicopters and the and the F-117As and the B-1, the B-2 bomber and, and all the other 20, 24 or 25 prototypes. Couldn't even get the nuts and bolts for that. So we've been lied to, folks, and I know we can do better. Black budget garners this figure, roughly one and a third trillion dollars every two years. Trillion. I'm not talking billion, folks. Trillion. If you don't know what a trillion is, it's a thousand billion. It's a big number. If you were to gar regard that in dollar bills, it would be 11 tons of dollar bills. That's how big a trillion is. Okay. The black budget literally means hidden budget. The U.S. Congress never sees the books of this clandestine pot of gold. Contractors of stealth, and I've listed quite a few here, ET and g Westinghouse, McDonnell Douglas, Morris and Knudsen, Black and Hood Security Systems, Boeing Aerospace, Lorimar Aerospace, Aerospecial of France, Mitsubishi of Japan, also Mitsubishi Heavy Electric Industries, Ryder Trucks, Bechtel, IG Farben, that's a chemical company, plus a host of hundreds more. Now I've talked about a number of topics that are rather controversial. I'm not advocating the overthrow of any government. I don't believe in such for the, same, for the main reason. The number one, it always kills the wrong folks. But I believe if I have the chance to tell people about these atrocities, I think that there will be some serious letter writing, if not letter writing, some serious uh, conscientious voting <coughs> done in the very near future on various elected government officials, if not the whole category of elected government officials. Now, the uh, construction of S-4 happened then after the construction of Groom Lake. S-4 followed Groom Lake, yes. Okay, so describe the, what you know about the construction of S-4, how that occurred. Well, they started tunneling from Groom Lake uh, back into the mountain for secure facilities. And they, they kept tunneling over the years. They kept tunneling until they came out the other end down there. And that's where they, that's where they put the captured alien vehicles, but that's where our most secret aircraft were stored too, is right next to the captured vehicles tr uh, up the tunnel towards Groom Lake. There's four levels in Site 4, excluding the top level, the surface, which is basically a hangar, hangars uh, with the satellite. There's Showing not too much to it, but the levels are all operated. There's the first and second levels are all elevator where they keep the flying disc, ships, whatever you want to call it. They bring it to the surface. Right when I was there, they were trying to operate the disc, but to my viewing, unsuccessfully. There's scientists there. There's, I mean, I have personally witnessed high. White House officials being there. Was well, there any reference to any of those dry lake beds? No. By name? I didn't hear any. I mean, we were just, as I said, I was just being the sentry there. You didn't hear nothing. It was called S4 or A4? S4. S4. We called it, I mean, it was called the museum. So, for you to actually leave base or get on base, they would take you down in a government vehicle and drop you off, what, in Las Vegas? At the Vegas? Tropicana Hotel. So that was the pickup drop off plane. At 12 o'clock on, uh, on, on a Thursday evening. At the end of each month. If they fell on a Thursday, it was on the last Thursday of each month. Me and they would rotate. Every, every week they were taking somebody for the weekend. Of, you know, they were rotating their sentries. Yes, they dropped us off at the Tropicana on Tropicana Boulevard, right in the back. 
somebody just drop us off and you had to stay with your group of people? To... No, we could, we could venture off and do what we want to do. Like I said, if you can get me in view of the facility itself or get me in the thing, I could probably re I could recognize where I'm at and get on with it. Because, I mean, you, we could see through the front windshield driving, but you just didn't. I mean, there was like a, a cover gate, you know, like a boot and a camper, mm -hmm. you know, like a little gate. And then the guy could shut it and open it at any mm -hmm. given time. Most yeah. of the time it was open partially. You don't know where the hell we're going. I mean, my first thing I thought, you know, that I was going to another to a secret Navy base myself when I, and then we got out and that was it, my first visit. But how long would you ride from, from you left from Nellis, did you? Vegas. From Vegas. Well, how long would you ride from Vegas until you got to this facility? Well, we'd ride to Nellis and then Nellis we'd ride for about another hour, stop for about 20 minutes, ride for another half hour, stop, ride for another hour, stop for about 10, 20 minutes to relieve ourselves, which was in back of the van, then the guy would come around and empty the thing. I think that they drove us around endlessly sometimes, you know. Because it was different times. Different times. Sometimes we'd be there in four hours, sometimes it'd be, you know, three hours, sometimes it'd be six hours. It was, I mean, the security for the place for arriving and getting there is extremely strict. They don't... So you couldn't sit down with a map and, and try to trace the rock, it'd be impossible. Yeah, I mean, even if you were sitting there, even if you, you're not allowed to have a pad and pencil in the van going there anyways. You're not allowed to, they take your watches, so you lose track of time. Oh, I, see. I mean, you, I mean, you get your watches and jewelry back when you get back, when you get onto the facility itself. Not allowed to carry a pen. No. So they didn't get to see the routes to and from as as the transportation came and went. They weren't able to look out once they were in the bus. The facility, the doors were closed and then the windows were blacked out. Nobody could look in and they couldn't look out. Why can hunt intelligence people control the area fifty one? They were driven in by Wacken Hut and they were watched by Wacken Hut. They could leave the facility but they they couldn't, nobody could leave alone. They had to leave together at least, and they were required to watch each other. Has any employee of Wackenhut uh, ever come out and described being a guard and what their duties were around Area 51, Groom Lake, or S4? Yeah, I'm, I don't know of any. So, so they're uh, able to keep those people fairly quiet compared to some of the well, military people? The business they're in, I guess they're scared enough, so they keep quiet. They, they drove them all the way back to uh, uh, S4, and it drove into a covered facility where they were taken out and went right into the reception room for level one, which is all they ever saw. We didn't discuss nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, that's how the I mean, how the football team's doing, and you know, basic basic talk. We didn't ever discuss. We get picked up in the van, and we took them to sit in there. Nice, comfortable ride. We get to the gate, and that's it. You know, that's the way I always got there. I never personally drove there. I mean, was the gate an external gate? It was outside where the yes, van went through? Yes. You drove through and went into this little, like, overhang, like an inspection center. Like a shelf. Oh, okay. You know, you get out, walk through a door, and you're some print, and then once that pass, present identification, and then they take you to the other gates, and they take you into the infirmary room, where not the infirmary, but the where the watch commander is, and they take us in and they individually polygraph us real quick. We had to sit there. We couldn't go anywhere to your bond, to your cubicles or anything. Until after you'd been polygraphed. After you were polygraphed, you went in that room. If you, you never were told if you passed or whatever. If you passed, I assume you just went back to work. Like that, they had posted the watch schedule where you're going to be, and then that was it. I don't know of any, well, how would you say, uh, interaction. interaction between any of the agencies that are involved, uh, to be honest, I don't even know who's really running the facility. I've heard it was ONI, but I don't think so. The sheriffs have stripped, that's all government land, that there's absolutely, if a sheriff comes on the land without authorization, then we have orders to shoot. There's no question, no badge, I mean, there's no, no limits to what now, if a sheriff catches anybody, I don't know, because I've never been there when a sheriff caught anybody or anything like that, you know what I mean? 
me, but they're not called out. We don't call out outside any kind of outside law enforcement intervention act whatsoever. They usually deal with security all by themselves. I mean, How many people do you think are on the facility tell And that was one and two in the ground levels, I'd probably have to say. Maybe 75. Levels three and four, I believe there's a whole new set of barracks down there. As I say, we see people coming and going. As long as they get through that elevator, they come up to we and we don't ask no questions. If that light hits red, then we detain people. I mean, believe I've never detained you, never detained me. I've never witnessed anybody being detained at the facility. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk about any of the base security systems, uh, detection equipment? Yes, uh, I know a little bit about it. Within a circumference of 200 yards completely surrounding the facility is all completely mined with explosives, what they call a C-26, which is a really super high and intense plastic explosive, a lot different than C-4, a lot more dense. Uh, then there's an infrared system around, but there's uh, four snipers on duty at all times with uh, starlight scopes. Uh, and then there's laser setups all around, which presented a problem a lot of times because of the environment outside would penetrate it. I believe the last two months out there, they upgraded it so it had to be somebody walking on two legs to complete the tour. It had to be an upright walking person to penetrate it instead of a four-legged. I mean, I guess these things, from what I've told, can determine weight um, when something walks through it which are, I believe, are about two feet off the ground, which are disguised, I believe, in cactus. I've never seen anything out there, but that's what I've been told is out there. I mean, when we go out on a search patrol, they'll turn it off on the search patrol. So if anybody was going to penetrate the base, if you're looking at a search patrol, then you know it's all right to get through the laser system, to get through that security, that security type of blanket. <clears throat> to get through the mines and stuff, it, it, you'd have to be an experienced you're going to have to crawl on your belly for at least a half of a mile and jab and move and jab and move before you can get through it. I mean, those, if they go off <coughs> and you're within a 10-foot vicinity, then you're, you'd be dead. Because that C-26 is a, a classified, I mean, it's supposed to be classified. I don't know what too many people know about it, but it's a high-grade explosive. It's a lot more volatile than c as I say, satellites pass over that area, especially, I mean, Eastern Bloc satellites used to pass over. I don't know about now, but in the last couple of months, it's pretty much, well, I don't know, but I assume they're still passing them over. They pass over pretty periodically, and they shut that place down. There's one satellite, I don't know the name of it, but when it passes over, we shut it down completely until it's completely off, then they open it back up again. Bring everything inside when everything. the satellite is due. Uh -huh. It's like uh, once every two days or something like that. It'll, it'll zip around. And I know it's a, I assume it's a Russian, or it might even be one of ours that they don't want ours, but with a high sensitivity to see, you know, the, some guy at the, na I guess, you know, what it, the National Security Agency pretty much controls the Cheyenne, you know, they jointly control those satellites. So. He knew that sometimes the craft from level two were taken up to level one and taken out. They had to wait for the Russian satellites to pass. They'd get them all ready, so as soon as it passed, they could take them out and work on them until it was due again. They'd bring it back in and close the doors once more. Okay, this is the dirt road comes on in. This is guard house one. You have to drive into an enclosed building, a little one. Guard comes out, you, you go over here for a thumbprint check and your identification. There's two other gates you gotta go through, but we're, oh, being security personnel, we never had to go through that. We would just go straight through. Now, a facility here is the ground level facility where they bring the disc up themselves. There's a door right here opens up. There's a big satellite 
in the and kind of in the rear here, and there's one in the front over here. It's pointing usually pointing straight up at all times. The nest hall is over in this corner. And there's a door to the parking lot, which a wall, and you can come right into the mess hall. Goes around, which is a hallway. Over here is uh, what you'd say here, CIC center, like on a ship, you know, where they monitor satellites and anything that's. If anything's moving over the facility, then they'll shut it down for a while. It's. I've never been in it. I've looked inside it, but I've never walked in. But uh, looks like a submarine control CIC. Room. Over here is a big access door. Now they bring the disc up one at a time. They never bring up more than one at a time. These are like the platforms that they bring them up on. And they move it right on out, bring it on outside if they're going to try to activate it in some way or anything like that. So this is like an open hanger, elevator platform. So yes. From the lower uh, compartment of a big old thing. Not bad. It doesn't look very big from the outside. I mean, it's because the discs themselves aren't very, I mean, you know, they're, I mean, yeah, I would say it's about 30 feet, 35 feet to the top. This is all open right in here. This is, uh, there's a lot of equipment laying around. I don't even know what, I'm going to begin to explain what it is because I have no idea really what it is. It looks like a cartoon up garage, I mean, with all kinds of computer diagnostic stuff and that's under a roof, though. That's all, all this is under a roof, except for the parking lot over here. Okay, how about a, a runway? A landing or take off airplanes? I've never seen an airplane land or take off. I've seen helicopters come and go, which is a pad about like about half a block back. It's like a little helo pad. This is his sketch of the layout at level number one showing the disposition of the facilities on the floor. He does not show the bays there over here. Yes, level one is basically your living, living quarters. There's four security detachments. All each has their own thing. One security detachment takes care of complete exterior of the facility around it constantly. One security detachment is gate and entrance. One security detachment is the levels, what I did, this is two, one, two, three, and four. And detachment one is your snipers. They keep everybody compartmentalized. We're not allowed to interact with any other security detachments whatsoever. We're not allowed to talk to them. We can talk to the people in our detachment only, you know, for a football game, because regular shop not I mean, no uh, shop talk or anything like that and then back here right here is like oh, this is very good one. right here is a medical infirmary that they do there's a a naval corpsman they give us physicals once every three months right here Another security office when you look at light cardiac examinations. Right here is pictures of everybody. It's like an office break room, like, but there's pictures of everybody. There's pictures of everybody in the facility with the exception of the people on level three and four. This is all open right here. See, because it's all wall. All you see is a brick wall, a block wall. Okay, first thing we do is we go to gate number one. We all line up, which is usually four of us at the same time we picked up. We all subject our thumbs to a print, taken into a back, taken into ushered through the next two gates, taken into level one. There's an office there. We go through a polygraph examination. After the polygraph examination, if your results were bad, which I've never heard of anyone being bad, I mean, or flunking your polygraph thing, I don't know what happened to you. I mean, I've never, no one's never just disappeared from 
the security detachment I was with. But you're subjected to a polygraph examination every time you come back from your one weekend of leave. How is Bob Lazar connected to S4? Bob Lazar was hired to do some back engineering on a, a certain disc. Uh, he called it the uh, space uh, sport model. Was when we got a look at uh, the outline of the disc, it was very close to the shape of the version two flying disc that Billy Meyer was photographing in, in Switzerland. Bob Lazar said the seats were smaller, they were for smaller people than him. Uh, there were only three seats, Billy described three seats aboard the craft. The outside shape was very much the same. Led us to speculate on where that craft came from. In 1988 and 89, a nuclear physicist and propulsion system scientist named Bob Lazar got several months of hands-on experience working on a classified, top-secret engineering project for a covert branch of the U.S. military aerospace program. Lazar's work included examination of extraterrestrial spacecraft recovered relatively intact over the decades by Central Intelligence, Special Air Force and Navy operatives and personnel. After telling friend John Lear about his experiences within a secret lab inside Area 51, Lazar found himself at the end of a gun in the secret Nevada facility and his job at S-4 was terminated shortly thereafter. Fearing the worst, Lazar went public with his claims of working on UFOs for the government and television investigative journalist George Knapp, now a Peabody Award winner, reported the story to the general public through KLAS-TV in Las Vegas. Did you meet Bob Lazar before Lazar went out to Area 51? Yeah, he was right, sitting right there. Goof, goof on, Gene Elf was sitting right there. We were talking about UFOs, they took their tape, they did their measurements. And we talked more about UFOs, and Bob told us we were nuts. And uh, that's when I first met him. How did the meeting go when George Knapp and his KLS TV news director, when they came out to your house uh, to meet with you and Bob Lazar? We sat right there, and with, with the other table was there. And uh, Bob strolled out, and just asked question after question after question after question, and Bob, because George Knapp wanted to do a series, and he needed Bob Stoldow's permission to go ahead. It was at that same meeting, um, Bob Stoldow said, "Go ahead, and do it." Lazar and S-4 became the object of intense scrutiny by UFO research investigators and reporters for the next several years, and his claims and evidence were presented by filmmaker and real estate appraiser Gene Huff in the film Excerpts from the Government Bible, The Bob Lazar Story. Many of the following statements by Lazar are from that film. Lazar says, in May of 1987, some scientists took an antimatter reactor to an underground blast facility on the Nevada test site to perform an experiment. Unfortunately for them, their experiment required them to cut the reactor open, which resulted in their deaths. I was hired, says Lazar, in December 1988 to replace one of these men. I worked in a number of scientific programs some of which required top secret and above top secret security clearances, of which the most easily verifiable is my 1980s job at the Los Alamos Maison Physics Facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. While working at Los Alamos National Lab in 1982, the local newspaper did a front page story on a jet car I had built. Coincidentally, Dr. Teller was giving a speech in Los Alamos that same day. We met and had a short chat about the jet car, and I later listened to his speech. I never met Dr. Teller again, but in 1988, when I decided to re-enter the scientific community, I sent him a resume and inquired about a job. And did Lazar investigate a classified library at Los Alamos and discover that Project Grudge was still ongoing? I don't know whether he did or he gave um, the job to a friend of his, because there was four questions that needed answers to. And one was um, Huawei-2, 
what that meant. Um, the classified library, and there was two other questions, and I forget what they were. Dr. Teller responded by telephone and told me that he was no longer active, but just functioned in a consultant capacity. He gave me the name of a contact to call in Las Vegas. I made that call, and things progressed from there until I got into the program. I never got a chance to ask Dr. Teller if he remembered me from Los Alamos, so I don't know if that was a factor or not. Why did Lazar decide to try to get employed at Area 51? Because we gave him enough information that he thought, you know, maybe there is something to this. And how did Lazar get the job at Area 51? And please describe specifically the interview testing process that he went through. He called, uh, and, I, and I thought I was there. He says I wasn't. I thought I was there when he called Dr. Teller. And Dr. Teller said, uh, Bob, do you want to work uh, in Livermore with me or out there in uh, Las Vegas? And Bob said, I want to work at Area 51. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Teller said, let me see what I can do. And so the next phone call, uh, he was given a number to call, and uh, they asked him out for an interview. And he got three interviews, and every, at the end of every, every interview, he'd come over and say, I aced it. And on the second interview, uh, he said, guess what their first question was? And I said, what? He said, uh, what do you know about John Lear and what's your relation with him? What's your relationship with him? So they already knew you were connected to each other. Yeah. So he said, uh, I believe that John Lear uh, sticks his nose into places where it doesn't belong. But what I didn't tell him was that I also like to stick my nose in places where it doesn't belong. <laughs> do, you do you still point it in uh, places it doesn't belong, or you uh, has age mellowed you a bit? Age has mellowed me a bit. I mean, tracking down this moon stuff is so much fun because all you have to do is sit at the computer and, and uh, look at the moon. Uh, how do you think Area 51 already knew that Lazar had a friendship with you, and why do you think that was important to them? Uh, yeah, why would that be important to them? And if I ask you on camera if you know Bob Lazar, can you just say no? I will sit silently. The first night uh, Lazar got back from S4 in Area 51, what did he talk about to you? That must have been a pretty dramatic night. Yeah. And, um, Did he yeah. talk about discs or aliens or? He came, he's, he sat here and he said, uh, I saw a disc today. And I said, what? He said, I saw a disc today. And I said, there's your eyes. And he said, there's. And I said, what are you doing here then? They're going to follow you here. They're going to know you. You're telling me. He said, John, let me tell you something. I've seen you take so much shit over this. I wanted to tell you I was there, I touched it, I saw it, it's real. Wow. Lazar continues, Between December of 88 and April of 89, I worked as a senior staff physicist in what has to be the most secret project in history. My place of work was a facility in an area known as S-4 on the Nellis Air Force Range in central Nevada. Area S-4 is located approximately 15 miles south of the infamous Area 51 installation at Groom Lake, where the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes were developed. For the duration of my employment at S-4, I was paid by the United States Navy. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51, which is a highly secure government base on the Nevada test site. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S-4. S-4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The airspace over Area 51 and S-4 is highly restricted and any pilot or aircraft that may stray into Sector R-4808 is subject to pursuit by jets scrambled for intercept or subject to outright destruction by surface-to-air missiles.
Tell me about the overflights over S4. Is that allowed by any pilot? No. Uh, not even red blue teams? No, Bob says that there's an automatic uh, ground air missile that nobody has the power to stop. That if you fly over S4, it goes immediately. The S-4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the sides of the mountain and the desert floor. The hangar was equipped with typical tools and extensive electronic equipment. It also had a machine with an x-ray emblem on it and an overhead crane rated at 20,000 pounds. Equipment in this hangar was marked with a black number 41 with a white circle around it, asserts Lazar. It was outside of this hangar that I saw the sport model tested. The program out at S4 consisted of three projects, Project Galileo, Project Sidekick, and Project Looking Glass. Project Galileo dealt with gravity propulsion. Project Sidekick dealt with a beam weapon that had a neutron source and was focused by a gravity lens. Project Looking Glass dealt with the physics of seeing back in time. I was now personally involved with the hardware of Project Sidekick or Looking Glass. Regarding Project Looking Glass that Lazar was briefed on, what was Lazar's understanding about uh, time and time compartmentalization? This is Project Looking Glass. All he told us was that um, the paradox of um, if you go back in time and kill your father, will you still be here? He said, yes, you will still be here because time is compartmentalized. As part of my indoctrination into the program at S4, I would randomly be taken into a small room which contained a table, a chair, and 120 or so briefings in blue folders. I'd be left there to read for varying amounts of time, usually about half an hour. Describe some of the information Lazar got from the blue folder briefing documents. He said just mostly talked about the nasty things we did around the world. I said, like what? And he said, oh, you know, like starting wars. And These briefings contained a wide spectrum of information, mostly relating to aliens and alien technology. These reports appeared to be an overview of alien information which could be used to brief scientists from any field about the scope of the whole project and not just their specific field of endeavor. The overview of Project Galileo was accurate. I read the overview and later witnessed evidence which proved it to be accurate. He also got to see a holographic book of some kind where there was, it was comparing civilizations, Earth civilization and the reticulant civilization. And when he looked at the book, uh, he would see Earth history, and when he flipped it over, he would see reticulant history. Yeah, actually what it was is on one side of the book, he had a book, um, like this, and this would be, um, our civilization, and look through it like that, and the, the pictures were three-dimensional, and that he could move it like that, and he could see inside, back, forward, outside, like that. And then, if you turn the book over like this, then the same thing with the retigaments. Uh, Interesting that uh, you're, the book you're holding is Alice in Wonderland. I got this because um, uh, the, the new secret base up in uh, Nevada uh, uses a lot of Alice in Wonderland terms. So I got the book to read all the terms that they use. I know you probably can't say who, but how did that information arrive to you that they were using Alice in Wonderland terms for the new base? Because either Bob or one of the um, people that worked up there said that when you went in the door of S4, there was a rabbit with a stopwatch up there. Somebody put a rabbit with a stopwatch up there.
there's a new base being created in Nevada that's moving away. Are you saying there's one that's going to move uh, the strategic operations that go on at uh, Groom Lake and S4 away from that location to another facility? Yeah, there's some that are at both those facilities that are different. And where in Nevada are they located? They're... Uh, Well, what area of Nevada? Uh, what north, part? Northeast. So towards the Utah border. Yeah. My job in this program was to be part of a back engineering team. Back engineering is the act of taking a finished product and tearing it apart to find out what makes it tick. The goal in this program was to see if the technology of the disc could be duplicated with earth material. I had at least partial view of nine different discs out at Area S4. Lazar describes the interior of the flying disc he nicknamed the sport model, in which he was allowed to go inside. I not only saw two of the three interior levels, but I also saw it fully functional in flight. And no, unfortunately, I didn't get to go for a ride in it. This particular disc appeared to be in excellent condition and because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The exterior skin of the disc is metal, which is the color of unpolished stainless steel. The Sport Model sits on its belly when not energized. The hatch is located on the upper half of the disc with just the bottom portion of the door wrapping around the center lip of the disc. The interior of the disc is divided into three levels. The lower level is where the three gravity amplifiers and amplifier guides are located. The gravity amplifiers of the disc can be focused independently and they are pulsed. Well, describe the time Lazar had been inside the flying saucer for work, you know, for the propulsion systems for element 115 for two and a half hours and when he came out Hardly any time had elapsed, and so Lazar had concluded the saucer was time shifted. Well, that's weird. I hadn't heard that time. I haven't heard that story in years. I've forgotten. I've forgotten that story, but I remember it now. I remember he did say that. Two and a half hours. Wow. God, it's been a long time since I heard that story. Is that accurate? Is that what he told you? Yeah. So what does that mean to you now, now that you're remembering that? I don't know. I just remember that before he went in, he had to take up all his watches, rings, everything, bracelets. The space-time distortion around the disc achieves maximum distortion and is folded up into this heart-shaped form. The disc can't be seen from any vantage point and for all practical purposes is invisible. All you can see would be the sky surrounding it. I was never given access to the upper level of the disc, so I can't enlighten you as to what the porthole-like areas are, other than I can assure you they're not portholes. The center level of the disc also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. The walls of the center level are divided into archways, at one point in time, when the disc was energized, one of the archways became transparent and you could see the area outside of it as if the archway was a window. After the panel had been transparent for a while, a form of writing which was unlike any alphabetic, scientific, or mathematical symbols I have ever seen began to appear on the transparent archway, and I was never informed as to how all of this was achieved, not that any of that would have required alien technology. The reactor, explains Lazar, is located directly above the three gravity amplifiers on the center level and is, in fact, centered between them. The element 115 is machined into triangles and is then inserted into the reactor. 
This piece of element 115 is the source of the gravity A wave as well as the target which is bombarded with protons to release the antimatter. Dr. Edward Teller was the key scientist who determined that fusion, as opposed to fission, could be used to create a nuclear bomb that would be even more destructive than the bombs dropped on Japan. Teller is known in the scientific community as the father of the hydrogen bomb. Teller's hydrogen bomb fusion process releases vastly more energy than fission and results in a much larger explosion from the identical amount of nuclear material as that within the bombs dropped on Japan. We never dropped the hydrogen bomb and, quips Lazar, Dr. Teller's been in a bad mood ever since. Is there any other nuclear reaction besides fission and fusion that you know of? No. Is there anything such as... Look, please, you try to explore the things about which I only will have to tell you it is not interesting, it's a waste of time. Plutonium or uranium. Look, it is, in my opinion, not interesting. I don't intend to answer it. If you ask me that question on camera, I will shut up. I will sit silent. You're not going to get an answer out of me on that. Okay. Teller refused to even acknowledge antimatter on camera, and in excerpts from the government Bible, Bob Lazar clearly explains the enormous destructive power of antimatter. The older atomic bombs, like those dropped on Japan, would create an area of total devastation only several miles long caused, says Lazar, by a fission reaction in which less than 1% of the nuclear material is converted to energy. But if a hydrogen bomb containing the same amount of nuclear fuel as the Nagasaki bomb were to explode, the area of total devastation would be approximately 20 miles. Now, if a bomb was made with the same amount of nuclear material as the Nagasaki bomb, and that material was antimatter, when that bomb exploded in Baghdad, says Lazar as an example, the area of devastation would include parts of Africa, Europe, and Asia, with the exact area of total devastation being very difficult to calculate. Besides the devastated areas, an antimatter explosion would wreak nightmarish consequences upon the Earth's atmosphere and ozone layer, as well as producing poisoning effects of tremendous nuclear clouds circling the Earth. This, says Lazar, demonstrates the enormous amount of power released when you totally convert matter to energy, which is what happens when antimatter and matter are combined. The potentially devastating consequences of an antimatter experiment gone awry now becomes painfully obvious. These are the real dangers of letting secret military scientists experiment with flying disks gathered in secret from UFO crash retrievals without necessary and vital congressional and civilian oversight. Do not forget that Lazar was brought to S4 to replace scientists who died due to an antimatter reactor experiment gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Says Lazar, there's a small segment of the United States government that makes scientific and technological judgments from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. If the following information is true, the United States government also makes judgments on a historical, philosophical, and even theological level from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. This technology was brought here by some alien beings from the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 star system. These stars are located in the constellation Reticulum, which can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, which means that it is two stars and is located approximately 30 light years from Earth. These beings are from Reticulum 4, which is the fourth planet out from Zeta Reticuli 2. The beings are 3 to 4 feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads. He saw, not only did uh, Lazar see discs there, he also saw aliens. What did this alien, these alien beings look like? He saw several different types or one type or... He saw, he saw the single type, the little gray, three times. Once through the door, once when he was taking the drugs, the pine smelling fluid, and once when he went to the MGM 
for the um, uh, lie detector test, when he opened the door for this room where they were going to take the test, there was a desk and a chair and a setting that reminded him of the, uh, the incident at S4 when he saw the uh, alien and he nearly fainted. Uh, uh, Gene Huff was there and said that he nearly fainted. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man as a species had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we are containers of. As I'm sure you know now, it was impossible for me to corroborate the information. Was Lazar purposely brought to S4, do you think, to leak information? That's always been a possibility. It's always been a possibility to leak information to John Lear. <laughs> it's false information uh, to lead them in a dire different direction. And, and I've never denied that. That could be true. John, that March 22nd tape with Lazar, why is that important in the history of uh, ufology? Because that's the first time that uh, Bob took us out there knowing ahead, uh, a day in advance of exactly the hour and the minute when that flying saucer would fly. And we saw it at that time. And uh, how many minutes did you get on camera? Nothing on camera. The camera was on the uh, bumper wheel. I forgot to take a big picture. <laughs> because you were so caught up in the event at that time. Did you ever get any photos of UFOs that you took yourself? Have you ever taken... No, but Bob or George Knapp did the next Wednesday night of it going around. Now, Have you ever had an experience with Whack and Hut security? I know you and Bob and Gene and some of your wives went out one time. Uh, it's a famous story where you went out to film and were... Yeah, and they, other than the, the, the thing out in the desert, no, no experience. What was your, uh, what was your feeling when uh, you guys were being held by the sheriffs there at that time? Were you uh, feeling in jeopardy at all or fairly cool-headed? You, you've been through combat and a lot of different things. What, how does that rank as far as stress well, levels? You know, uh, S4 let us go, and then when we got out onto the highway, that's when uh, Doug, um, what was his name? The sheriff. The sheriff. That's when he stopped us, and he knew all of us. And uh, he said, okay, hands against the car, you know, all I want to know is two things. Why are there five guys in this car, and there was only four on the test site, and where's the nine millimeter? We just didn't say anything for an hour, and then pretty soon he said, I don't know why I'm supposed to tell you this, but what I'm supposed to tell you is to get out of here and never come back. How was Bob Lazar treated by the FBI agent uh, on the debriefing the day after the night, uh, viewing objects above Groom Lake with you? Uh, I don't know. Bob said it was pretty rough. What did he say happened? And then they took him out of the car with a gun in his ear and he said, now Bob, when we gave you this clearance, it didn't mean you were supposed to tell all your friends about the flying saucers. And what did Bob do after that in regard to disclosing information? Well, he, you know, he didn't make up his mind then. He said that, uh, Mm. He, he didn't clearly say he wanted to stay or didn't want to stay, but eventually he decided not to stay. And eventually he left S4. Yeah. So is it possible Lazar was given false information in hopes that he would spread it, do you think? Or do you think this is what he discovered was actually what was going on? Where are you today on that? I think he discovered what was actually going on, but I do admit the possibility that it was, you know, bogus. Well, do you keep in contact with uh, Gene Huff and Bob Lazar at all? Um, what's Lazar's uh, stance on everything these days in, in regard to S4? How's he, he doesn't want to talk about anything about it. He's still involved in the nuclear industry, is that right? 
supposedly. But he doesn't want to publicly come out or discuss it anymore because he feels threatened, because he doesn't want to be discredited. Well, he got his clearance back, and one of the uh, one of the promises when he got his clearance back is they said, "Now, Bob, you're not going to give us any more trouble, are you?" Obviously, if this information is true, the ramifications are far-reaching, and you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to figure that out. Lazar summed up his feelings when stating, The hardware and technology that I was exposed to should be placed in the proper hands of the scientific community, and it is the right of every person on Earth to know that there is physical evidence which proves that there is life elsewhere, and that at least one form of that life has been here. 